So we are now being recorded. Plan accordingly. <laughs> That's right. And all right. So I think we're ready to go. So this is um, Eliza Richardson, assistant professor of geosciences, and to talk about a game that developed in the earth and mineral sciences. And then we can also talk about how this could be applied to other labs. All right, great. Thanks. All right. So I should say right away that anytime you want to ask questions to interrupt, go ahead, because I have a tendency to blabber on without paying attention to the fact that people are hoping to get my attention. So <laughs> um, anyway, so this, this game um, was one of the first projects created um, through the R&D initiative in the John A. Dutton e. Education Research Institute. And that R&D initiative was led by Kusro Kidwai, who has been hired away to Southern Maine. Um, <coughs> but the, um, the group of people listed there, so Kusro was the head of the R&D initiative. Uh, Jeff Rail did most of the programming for this game, and he was a master's student in um, earth and mineral engineering. He just graduated over the summer. And then Jason and Mayu did most of the character and sort of design work. So anytime I say I or we, really what I mean is they, <laughs> when we're talking about how this game got created. Um, okay. So the point of this game, so this is a flash-based game, um, and that was one of the ideas, it's part of creating this, is that um, <coughs> Jeff learned to program when he built this game. So this is the first, the first real programming experience larger than Hello World that he'd ever really done, which is pretty cool. Even though by the time he finished, he realized the flash was on its way out, but that's, it's still fun. All right, so the point of it was, um, was to teach the process of mineral identification to students at a distance. And I have process highlighted because um, in my philosophy of teaching, at least for a lab like this, was that the object is not to have students walk out knowing how to identify 50 minerals but to teach them what a scientist does when confronted with an unknown mineral and what they do to try to figure it out. So that was the point of this lab. Um, and the reason we turned this thing into a game is because we were hoping to show that even like the most traditional hands-on labs that geologists always say couldn't possibly work online. You know, the rock ID lab is always the one called up to but how do I know if I rock online? You know, um, we said, all right, this, this, is, this is the thing we're going to show that it really can be done. So, um, all right. So this is a screenshot from the early history of where this thing came from um, was the ubiquitous Rock ID Lab in a class that I used to teach quite often, the large neural and gen ed class. Um, with, so for non-science majors, 200 kids in a lab with TAs and lectures and multiple choice tests and that kind of thing. Um, and G520 is the kind of test that, or it's the kind of class where um, I think it's one of the least painful way to fulfill the lab requirement if you're like an English major or something. So those are the kind of people that we got in this class. All right. um, so, so in about 2006, I revamped like a lot of the labs because they were terrible and boring. And so one of them was the Rock ID Lab. Um, and so this is kind of a screenshot from like the text of the lab where um, Instead of making people go through the motions of identifying 25 or however many minerals for no apparent reason, because this class is not a prerequisite for anything else, there's never a class they're going to take after this where their instructor in that class is going to expect them to identify rhyolite in hand sample. So, is that what we're trying to do here or what? So, really, we're trying to teach them the process of science and some critical thinking. So, I made a logic puzzle out of this lab. And the idea was, um, oh, and if you remember, do you remember the 2006 Orange Bowl where Penn State played Florida State? I don't know. Anyway, it went to two overtimes because of all the missed field goals. It was a very stressful game. But I revamped this lab sort of right after that game, and so all the Janet students were right on top of this kind of thing. So, the, so the, the plot was, okay, you've got five people in a house with five rooms, and they're watching this game, and if you include halftime, the game has five parts to it, not including the overtime. Um, and, and they all apparently are rock hounds. The plot kind of breaks down here. Uh, and so they brought, they each brought the same five mineral specimens to this party where they were going to watch this game, but somebody stole one mineral from each person and hid it somewhere in the house at some point during the game. So the idea is you have to identify each mineral in your box and figure out which one was stolen from which person, when during the game, and where in the house it's hidden. So 
So, <laughs> so and oh, and the characters that, that we made up for this were me, uh, the lab TA, uh, Ed Rendell, who's the governor of Pennsylvania at the time, and Graham Spanger, and then Roethlisberger. And I think tell you right now that if you're going to make up a game, it is much better to not use real people's names in case something happens later and you're wondering if people are going to think you're an idiot for a few people. So, so we did take time for consideration when we made this program. But, all right, so, so here's like kind of like the guts of the logic problem. Things like, um, you know, the mineral with the metallic luster went missing during the third quarter. So, so you have to figure out which minerals have metallic luster to figure out the clues to puzzle. And I can tell you, it's a little bit of a trick to write a logic puzzle like this because you really want to make sure that every clue has exactly enough information, not too much and not too little, so that they're forced to go through every one of them before they can solve the puzzle. Um, and so, okay, that's fine. And it does make them go through the process of science because they have to make their own decision about, all right, this is the mineral I'm going to test, and this is what I'm going to test it for because I want to know if this was the mineral that Ben Roethlisberger lost in the kitchen or whatever. Um, on the other hand, this puzzle has a completely rigid framework. Because of the way I wrote it, if I'd wanted to change the minerals or make it 10 minerals or three, I would have had to completely rewrite it from scratch because it's written exactly to work, right? Um, and since we're doing this in a real life lab, you have to have the hand samples there and all the equipment that you use to test rocks, hydrochloric acid and scratch plates and whatever else. Um, so, so the challenge to make a game out of this was to, um, to make this lab work resistant and make it a game. So we want to avoid rock kits in the mail. Uh, people do that and I think it's a complete waste of time because you really don't know what shape the rocks arrive in when they get to the person on the other end You can't supervise them. And also, it, it speaks to the wrong point of this lab, which is not really to learn rocks, it's to learn science. So, so I think when you design something, you have to realize that that the whole sending rockets in the mail, it's just like, it's like trying to shoehorn a face-to-face -face lab into the online environment without thinking at all about what the point of the lab really is. So let's not do that. Um, we also want to avoid memorizing vocabulary, which is the bane of low-level science classes. Um, and also tedium, identifying 50 rocks is boring if you don't care. So we also we want to include teaching the process of science, teaching inquiry methods, hopefully. Um, and we also want to build in flexibility, so we want to get rid of the rigid framework of my original puzzle. That was the hope, anyway. All right. So, given that we have like you know, people in the house, the the Jeff and the other designers were like, oh, this is just like the game Clue. Um, and here's an interesting thing we found when we piloted this game. If you're younger than say me, you have never played Clue. <laughs> Kids have no idea. What, what do you mean? Just like Clue? What's that? Mean? <laughs> is that funny? I, I was surprised. By this. Anyway, okay. So, so here's an interesting thing about Clue. The the name Clue. Is trademarked by Parker Brothers, but the actual names of the characters are not trademarked. Oh. Mm -hmm. So you can actually have Miss Scarlet instead of Ben Roethlisberger, and that's great. <laughs> no problem. So we did that. Um, and so here's like kind of the entry screenshot of the game. It, there's a there's a couple screens that's cool too that kind of sets you up. You're in a house watching a football game with minerals. Pick your character and put your ID in and then you go. Mm -hmm. um, and so here's the layout of here's the floor plan. And it looks kind of like the clue game board, right? And so I'm I'm Miss White in this, and I'm down there, and I just walk into the house. Um, and this is kind of a complicated setup, but you see it a lot of times in the game. So the idea is that over on the left, there's a bunch of toggle switches. The top one um, you hit if you want to leave the room you're in. The next one is the clue notebook. Then there's a checklist, which is basically like your matrix of trying to figure out the answer to the puzzle. And then at the bottom, it's like the answer card that you turn in. Um, so one of the things that, that we are kind of hoping for in next steps is that the toggle switches, those icons look a lot like each other, and and even the definitions of them are sort of ambiguous. So in the pilot, people spend a lot of time trying to figure out, click and unclick, and oh, that's the wrong one, and that kind of thing. Um, but so that's next. Um, so the deal is that you're in here, and if you click on a room, your character will walk into the room. And you can actually watch a little animation of the person doing it, and then you'll get a view of the room you're in. Um, over on the right, where the green arrow is, is the laboratory, and that's where you can do the virtual tests on the minerals. All right, so so if you're playing the game, um, what you do is you click on a room, you go in the room, and this one is the kitchen. Over on the right, there's a little label that tells you you're in the kitchen in case you forgot. But when you run your mouse over different things in the kitchen, they all um, expand a little bit, and you can click on them. And a little clue will pop up like this, where it'll say something like, there's a fragment here from a mineral that has a hexagonal crystal habit. Um, 
or it'll say, there's chili on the stove, but no clues here, or something like that. Um, and so now the idea is, if you're a student and you don't know which minerals have a hexagonal crystal habit, you got to get yourself out of the laboratory and, and do some tests. Um, and every time there's a clue that pops up that says things like, there's a fragment here for a mineral that has a hexagonal crystal habit, it puts those clues in the clue book. So you don't have to sit there with pencil and paper. Um, and we argued about this a little bit because I said, well, but you know, part of the name of the game in science is keeping track of your observation on your own. Um, but, but I think, I don't know, I, at some level, I do think the fact that you still have to make choices about what you're going to test next and how you're going to proceed and what, how to do the logic puzzle. But they figured this was enough of a cognitive burden, so, so I lost that argument. Anyway, so, <laughs> so all the clues are here, and you can and you can always find them. And to look at the clue book, you have to click the little red clue book. And it's a toggle switch. So to get rid of it, you just click that icon again. OK. Um, if you find out some things, um, like back here, if Mr. Green says that he knows he still has his magnetic mineral, typo, and his mineral is three planes of cleavage, and you know which ones those are, you can put a little X by Mr. Green and you know magnetite and and testing felt so I can tell you the answer to that one. So, <laughs> um, and, the, and later on, you can fill in this. All right, so when you go down to the lab to test things, um, your little person walks down there, and then a little screen pops up where you can decide to test a particular property of every mineral, or you can test um, either, well, it's either by mineral or by property. So you can test you know, the hardness of every mineral, or you can test every single thing about one of the minerals. Um, and when you, when you decide what kind of test you're going to do, it's sort of, you get to watch a little video of a person we're going to test what color magnetite is on a street plate. So these guys spent time taking videos of themselves doing this, which is sort of fun. Um, but, and here's another sort of argument we had, is that at the end, every time they do a test, it basically kind of tells you what, what the answer is. So even if, if you weren't paying attention, you can see the fact that magnetite is black. And I lost that argument, too, because I was sort of thinking, well, look, part of it is having to make your own observation. On the other hand, if it's through a computer and color is one of the things you're looking at, then you have to realize that not everybody's screen is the same. So the fact that you still had to make your own decision about what thing you wanted to test was sort of the winner here. Um, and it's, it took them a while to make all those videos, too. It's just kind of fun. And also, it's, the way the storyline goes, you can test kind of any property at any time. So you actually have to be a little smart to know which ones to test so you're not sitting there watching videos all day long. You can't just, and you have to select every one. You can't just say, show me every single thing, right? Um, okay. So at some point, um, when you found all the clues from the first quarter, you'll, you'll have a little screen letting you know, uh, and then you can move along in the game. This game has a slightly rigid storyline, and part of the reason to do that is because it keeps people from going right to the answer card and just guessing random things until they get them all right. Um, you, you basically are forced to find enough clues that you could have solved the puzzle, and it won't let you submit unless you do. So that's part of the, the more science left game part of it, I guess. Um, so midway through the game, you'll have a clue book full of clues. Um, and you might have your, your check sheet, your little matrix puzzle thing, looking kind of like this. You can type in anything to those boxes. I just use that because you know. So for example, what this is showing is that I know Miss Scarlet is the one who lost Muscovite. And I also know that quartz was found in the kitchen during the first quarter. But I don't really know too much else yet, say. Um, <coughs> once you've. Once you know every single thing about a person, uh, or really any time, you can go to this answer card and select the answers from the drop-down menu. So when you get to the end and you've got all the clues and tested all the minerals, you select everything from the drop-down menu. And then down in the bottom left corner, that little, this used to be red, right? Now it changes to green and this button says submit. So this is basically how you how you finish and how you turn in your work. 
Um, in fact, right now, that's just a dummy button. So there's no database backend yet. So right now, what people do is take a screenshot of this <laughs> and turn it in, which isn't really ideal. But um, but you know, people have to graduate and move on and turn over the project to the next person. So here we are. Um, but yeah. So this is this is sort of the state of the art, and it, and it basically works. Um, I can send you the URL if any of you want to mess with it and play it. Um, but we haven't used it in a real class yet. We've only piloted it. So over the summer, because this game really did just finally get finished in this, this past summer, we piloted it um, in a master's level class with about 10 students. Um, and in this class, those 10 students were actually all like middle and high school teachers, science teachers. So we had them go through the game, and we asked them if the procedure was straightforward, how long it took them to play, if that seemed onerous or OK, um, and if it was worthwhile or not, and if they'd ever use a game like this. Um, and what they told us was that they couldn't beat the game by random guessing, which I consider a plus. Uh, they said the navigation was not intuitive enough, and I agree with that. That's sort of the next thing to, to work on. Um, and they were, they sort of, they realized about the, the sort of scientific critical thinking aspect and they agreed with us that since they had to think and make their own choices and keep track of all their evidence, that was, that was a good part and it was different from a live rock ID lab where that never really happens. You're just writing stuff down. Um, they were annoyed that they couldn't bypass the storyline, <laughs> but I actually find that to be somewhat of a plus. I mean, it kind of depends. You, know, you, you don't really want people to get right to the end and just be able to, to guess, 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 guess and finish without ever doing anything. Yeah. But on the other hand, if if um, if you had gotten, if you had enough clues that you knew what the mineral was, but you hadn't found enough clues in the room according to the game, it wouldn't let you out. Like what you, but, but you didn't really know that. So the way the game is set up is that if you if you kind of like skip the room you're supposed to be in, because there's a lot of hints about like what room you should search in next, um, and if you go to the wrong one and try to skip past it, you just won't find any clues in that room at all. And you have to go back to the room that you should have been in, find enough, and then they'll let you go. But there's nothing really telling you that. So if you didn't realize that was happening, you'd be in a room thinking there must not ever be any clues in here. Then later when you go back to it, there were some, and that was like totally confusing to people. So, so I feel like the fact that you can't bypass the storyline works at some level, but there needs to be um, there needs to be some kind of alert that tells you why. That tells you what what, the, what you know why. You, know, you need to find one more clue in here before you can go to the mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't try it, you know, or something, right? Or you're in the wrong room. Yeah, I mean, or, yeah, or something like that, right? Most games have a character with social media. Yeah, right. You're well, not ready. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was the thing that we, we spent time saying, like, should it be a storyline or should I mean, like, in the, in the board game clue, which, of course, none of our people had ever played, apparently, you know, you can go to any room you want, as long as you hold the right number on the and get there, and then you can start asking your questions, right? I mean, I'm trying to remember how this game works. but, but. So if you try to play this game like that, it doesn't work. But but the guys who are programming, like, oh no, a lot of big games, there really is a storyline. You're supposed to follow yeah. along. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I'm learning. That's good. <laughs> so that so that was fine. But but yeah, like having an alert that says why you can't be where you are is would be. And a random cook in the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, or right, or the head of some other anonymous person pops up. Yeah. No. <laughs> Go back. Yeah, they like this. Um, and then, of course, they complained that they didn't really cover enough minerals for standard curriculum. They couldn't use it in place of what they're doing. And I kind of say, eh, to that, because you know most teachers work in a command and control environment where they are told what to teach and sometimes what day to teach it. And you know your students have to know this, this, and this. And there's going to be a standardized test, which is probably not very well put together. They're going to test that later. And we could argue about that all day. But, but anyway, so that. So to me, when someone says, look, this doesn't cover enough minerals for my curriculum, then I think, uh-oh, they missed the point. Because the point is the process of science, not really you know, giant mineral cataloging knowledge. That's my philosophy, anyway. Um, but if you included more. Yeah. I mean, it would be like, oh, yeah. I'm just intrigued. Right. Because like, like, there are some minerals that students are going to identify with more right. or you're really interested in. Yeah, so I, I also think that, you know, in the next iteration, if you made this flexible enough that you could say, you know, this is the game, this is the game you play if you're on the Eastern Seaboard and we're going to use a dozen rocks that people see all the time here. Whereas if you go out to California, there's a different set 
set of stuff you see on the ground all the time, and that would be a, a regional edition. Mm -hmm. Or you could say to the student, look, or somebody, you know, do this, but with your own minerals that you think are interesting, something like that. Um, I was yeah. to say another, if you could get more minerals in there, you could also randomize it so yeah, every yeah. time you played the game it was slightly right. different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was one of our, that was, that's definitely part of the next step too. Is that right now, there's one answer. There's one seed to the program, which means that in a class of 200 people, all you have to do is feel like, oh, you know, <laughs> except for the fact that the storyline won't be bypass it. So, you know, but I still feel like you can, you can still get by that and she and never have learned a single thing. But if there's a random seed, the only thing right now that's randomized is that the clues are in different places every time you initialize it. So it's still like the same minerals in the same room, but where you find the clue isn't, but that's just clicking around anyway. That was the simplest thing I had to find. Um, to me, like, well, but there's, there's still the issue of like the logic puzzle setup. So we still actually have a little bit of that in here, and that means that you putting a random seed in is a little harder than just doing it, because you have to write the clues to make it to work. So I feel like a step toward random seed would be just multiple storylines that all work, because something's worked out, like seven different storylines or something. Did you have a way of um, making that the particular process of identifying the minerals um, explicitly stated, like is there a checklist or something that students went through, or um, I assume they also covered it some outside the course, but in, yeah. in the game itself, was there some kind of structure to kind of express that or, or? Yeah, that's a good point. So like, I, so basically what, the way it worked was that um, when you get a clue that will say something about, you know, we found a mineral here that has a metallic luster. And then if you don't really know which mineral it was, because you know, the, you, know the, you know the names of the minerals you're trying to describe. So then you go down to the laboratory and you can say, I want to test luster for every mineral here. So yeah, yeah. there's a way to do that. Um, that was like the last thing that got built into, so it's a little funky. But Would you, yeah, I mean, I know you haven't had a chance to use it in a, a real setting yet, yeah. but um, knowing that your hoped for outcome is that they've learned about the process of science, what do you envision, or maybe you might not have gotten this far yet, but in how you'll assess whether it did that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, at some level, there's this sort of self-reporting part of, like, you know, what what steps did you take to figure out the answer? And, mm -hmm. and it would almost be nice if, if we had a database back end that could log how many back and forths they did. Mm -hmm. You know, like, not on a checklist, but I can't remember that clue, so let me go back there and let me go back here. And, or, or if a person <coughs> um, really got all the information they could about the clues they had in a given juncture. Or and even a level, discussion. I'm not sure that really gets to the process of science, but it gets it how good they are. <laughs> well, even like a self-reflected, like a discussion yeah, right, forum right, right, where you right. ask key questions like, you know, so, so what did you, you know, what did you think about this yeah. or what was your strategy for that right. or, you know, and kind of right. pull out from them that they yeah. actually were learning the process. Yeah. I mean, I think part of that too is setting it up the right way. You don't just hand these people the assignment and say, I'll see you in a week, you know. Yeah. You have to say, here's the objective here, so be self-aware when you're doing it. Yeah. That's right or not, you know. Meta-analysis of simulations of this nature have shown that most students will do trial and error unless they are prompted to do reflective things. Yeah. If they're not prompted, they won't do it. <laughs> well, just True human beings. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it makes yeah, sense, but it's yeah. been... Yeah, Interesting. There's been dozens of studies that analyze right. and it's a common thing. Right. And I Interesting. Think, I think a lot of faculty members, and myself included, there's always this issue at the beginning of like, well, I want them to see the point of it on their own without me having to tell them what the point is. But you can never get away too much. That's the first thing I've learned. Yeah. They won't see the point unless you tell them. You know, and, and, that's, and sometimes they still won't, so you might as well go ahead and tell them. <laughs> but, I think, but I think you're right. It's sort of like, I mean, leave them to the answer, but not really quite. And then they're kind of like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So some, yeah, I like that either, like, you could probably even do self-reflection as you go through, you know. Hey, it's half time. Right. What do you think now? Yeah. Blah, 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 you yeah, know. Yeah, could. I mean, it would give them more tasks and more things yeah. popping up, though. But. That could yeah. to break the flow of the game. Yeah. But, yeah. but it could be done. I mean, you have to try to balance out how that happens. Because I mean, you can have it happen naturally within the game, so a character comes up, as opposed to just having a pop-up window or something yeah. like that, so it's actually meshed into the game deeply. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the same person who tells you to go back because you jumped ahead too far. It's also yeah. the one who says, I, I bet if you look back over the clue books, you'll find that you know more about the kitchen than you thought. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, oh, interesting, but black it streak, to, you know. Yeah, it would have to know. Yeah. Well, like, what's that you just watched Sherlock Holmes, right? And of course, Watson. Right? And maybe yeah. your character can have a sidekick. Oh, good idea. Help you Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Um, right, right, right. Without all the fighting, maybe. Right. <laughs> or maybe the fighting. Interesting camera angles. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we, I think, like, the, the simplest thing to do is to make the toggles one, want to, because it's not obvious what they are. And when they're activated, they don't do anything like light up or get bigger or anything like that. So. Even uh, even when I went through making screenshots for this talk, I was like, wait, now which is the one that I'm going to, yeah. If I can't remember, then it's, that's not a very good event. Um, but, but, you know, this is the first foray into programming for so um, And then, like, for example, like the little thing down at the bottom, like, what in the world is that, right? <laughs> like, there's no way to know until the very end. That that red light is going to turn green and then it's going to turn green. Right. Yeah. Like, because cause it's completely inactive up until that point. Well, actually, it's inactive the whole time because it hasn't been built. But, but you spend the whole time being like, can I click my Maybe that's what gets rid of anything. Oh, it's <laughs> 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 um, On most software programs like Word and everything, if you let it head, let the cursor right. hang over it, a little it tip. tells you the title. Yeah, right. that would be nice. Right. And that that's all you would need. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, so, so, and people would be, oh, okay, right. now but I know. There's something like, like having that, that kind of model gray background glow a little bit white when it was activated, but also mm -hmm. be yeah. intuitive enough that people would know what that meant. Well, and you know, considering that it was um, their first foray yeah. into this, uh, you know, now, and, and just for the rest of you, you know, that was our, we had just started this R&D initiative, and, and now we're actually changing that. Uh, model so it's integrated with within our learning design group. So now we actually have hired in the meantime like three new people who could probably, if it was a year ago, could have done this sure. with Eliza. So it would be interesting though to get those more experienced eyes on it now. Yeah. And say like, oh, you know, because it's a great first step, and say, yeah. oh yeah, all you need is the hovering over, and all you need is, you know, right. I think they could just take it and run with it. Probably, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. would be pretty cool. Yeah. And, and I think another sort of farther long-term idea is that there are a lot of intro science classes that start with a boring classification lab. Plants or yeah, fish or types, bugs. Animals, yeah. I mean, I really a lot. And so this framework is flexible enough that you could do something like this for a lot of those courses, um, and it would and it would. It's not like to free up lab time because this is the kind of thing people can do on their own time. But, um, yeah, but it's, it's just it's a nice idea for, I think, I feel like science classes, they're some of the, the biggest foot barriers in terms of how to make something work online because they're so worried about the equipment and the supervision. And, and for some things, it's really, I mean, yes, there's not everyone has a synchrotron in their house, so you can't do everything <laughs> remotely, right? But, like, but some things like this, you can because it's not that important that someone holds sulfur in their hand, really. I mean, it is if they're going to be a geoscience major, but then those people aren't taking the class. So, right? I mean, I think there's doing a simple reflective um, work on Angel or something with it. That's enough information that someone could do a qualitative study on it and codify it. Um, if you just ask key questions, like you were saying, just after they do this. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, that would offer the reflection thing, but it would also give you, after you do it for a couple of semesters, you could code all that information and find some correlations amongst the sample, yeah. the sample student body. Yeah. So, I mean, because I, I, I keep thinking about how you would assess with this, how you right. would do that, and just doing a simple, a simple discussion board on ANGEL and stuff like that after they do this activity. Right. <clears throat> is just finding those key questions yeah. and then asking them how to improve it, what are their suggestions, because everybody's going to come in with something different. Yeah. And part of it's a generational thing, too, I noticed that... But it, with ANGEL, you can uh, go ahead and yeah. find out the demographic of the person, sure, whether sure. they're male, what yeah. their age group, and right. then you can, you can go ahead and see the correlations between those also. Yeah. I think also, I don't know if you talked about this, but are you finding that with the game, students are 
doing better, like on exams or quizzes or exercises related? You know, like are they thinking about it in a different way than they had been before? Well, I, yeah, I mean, at some level, at least with, with mineral ID and that kind of thing, um, more work has been done for us by all the CSI programs on TV than we could have ever done for ourselves. <laughs> 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 I mean, the idea that like analog is patient is awesome. I get that that never used to happen. But now, <laughs> and now people come in and they're like, right. <laughs> I didn't think, you know, you talked about using this in like a gen ed type class, well, but right, in right. your graduate program yeah. for teachers, right, right. how awesome. Yeah, that would be totally inspirational. Yeah, I think I, think yeah. I liked it. And I don't, um, so that's a good point. I haven't filed with it with, with, with your um, actual yeah. undergrad yet. <laughs> <laughs> so is this, uh, is, this, is this game's purpose supposed to be uh, to identify, to help people to identify certain minerals. I'm sorry, I'm not a science major. No. The most science I ever get is from Big Bang Theory, so. <laughs> Love that show. <laughs> yeah, but that's what, that, I mean, I don't even understand, I just like the show. <laughs> but um, is it to identify certain minerals, or is it to, like, replace a certain curriculum in the future, or is it, like, to facilitate people to have more motivation approaching about the minerals? It, I mean, well, at some level, it's, you are at least knowing how to identify the five minerals that happen to be in here. Um, but the point was really more to teach people the process that a scientist would go through who doesn't know how to identify a mineral. Mm -hmm. And like, this is, I mean, I, I'm just asking because yeah. I'm not really yeah. familiar with it, but going through this game process has a better benefit than the, so you would have a traditional way of actually identifying a mineral. Right. Well, so the traditional way that these labs usually are run is that you hand people this big box of rocks or minerals, uh -huh. and and you go through step by step all the ways that you can, you know, all the tests that geologists do to all the ways you can classify them. <laughs> right? And then you and then two hours later they finally finish performing uh -huh. every test on every mineral, and then you spend a lot of time saying, well, some tests are diagnostic right away, and you don't have to do the other four, uh -huh. but sometimes you do, because quartz and another thing would come save each other until you do the other thing, yeah. And so, and by that time, the students are like, I've never seen this before in my life, I'll probably never see it again, because it only exists in special museums and the basement of bike building. So, um, so then you're kind of thinking to yourself, well, this is a class for non-science majors, uh -huh, okay. who are never again going to ever have to identify these minerals. Uh -huh. So, in this is the philosophy, I guess, of a lot of the gen eds in our department. Is that it's, it's better to teach people something about how scientists think. I see, I see. Okay. Than about, uh -huh. and, and along the way, they will learn uh -huh. some content, too, hopefully. Uh -huh. but, but really, the point is uh -huh. to say, you know, there is, there is, there is a method. People uh -huh. don't just wander around and say, that looks sure. like that. You know? Sure, sure. Uh -huh. you know, and, and, and hopefully, the game solidifies the idea that, that, that there is a method, and that science is kind of a puzzle. When you get to the point where you're doing your science and not just sitting in a lecture. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to know, like, uh, because if it was a game to help want people to get more and more motivated and to have people to be more engaged in science, rather than um, showing non science major people this is how the process is, I mean, I thought that not doing a pilot study with graduate students who were science teachers, right. th those people would, like, generally, would like to try something else. I was wondering how the result would be when you have done science majors, a yeah, bunch of them, and yeah. hey, try this, 
try this, and not saying, you're going to do this instead of a class, but you're going to do this instead of playing Gears of Wars or something. I mean, will they do that? I mean, will they have the motivation uh, to go back to the game and try, hey, this is interesting, I want to try it out again? Or will it be just a game that, hey, it's better than just reading textbooks, so I'm going to do this? Right. But, but I mean, I yeah, I mean, if there could be certain motivation level that would kind of like, of course, Gears of War, I mean, that would be a lot of fun, but if, if it would be, if it would arise so that the students will have more interest in it outside of the class a little bit more, mm -hmm. could have them more engaged in it, and this could be also some sort of like a facilitator for them to actually get into knowing more about identifying minerals. I don't know which class actually does that though, but... See, like, the thing is that what I'm understanding what you're trying to say is the best way to go ahead and teach people is by modeling for them. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a teacher try and inspire and so on and talk them through the steps mm -hmm. or letting someone just hand them a box and say, here are all the ways to do it, figure out how to do it mm -hmm. the most, um, most efficient way, the computer is walking them through the most efficient way to approach it. So it's giving them a pattern, a model to follow. Mm -hmm whether it be blatant or subconscious, they're learning an order of how to do it. Mm -hmm. So if they cross this to different platforms like botany and different things like that, they'll start to understand that order of scientific analysis mm -hmm. and then just intuitively start doing it. Because a lot, of, like we, you said, people just don't think about doing things. They don't, meta sure. they, their metacognition is not in gear all the time. Mm -hmm. It's quite exhausting. So that's what they're doing. They just, they start to learn patterns. Our minds are built that way. So okay. this builds towards that. And but then if that's used in a classroom, then what would be the teacher's role in the classroom then? The person who says, oh, you can't figure this out, let me help you. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things like how she was saying, having the person go back and do it. Uh -huh. You know, you, sometimes you have to have a teacher go ahead and say, you have to go, um, I don't understand why I'm going. Uh -huh. So it has to be able to flag the teacher uh -huh. because, you know, People have their different areas of, um, I guess it's called, in learning theory we call it zone of proximal development. That area, yeah, so that area, sometimes you just need help. And sometimes people aren't intuitive, like she was saying with the controls, to figure them out. So that's where, oh, you have an instructor to help and stuff like well, that. Well, helping with the reflection. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Guiding the reflection, yeah. setting it up and guiding the reflection. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. My question is, how can you integrate macro issues into this. So you were saying that you want students to be engaged with this like after class and go back to it. Mm -hmm. And kind of the way to do that is to show them like why are minerals important? Like why should I care? Uh -huh. Instead of like, hey, all these people brought a rock to this party. Like, <laughs> hey, these people have brought these rocks to this party for this reason and like these minerals are really cool and like these are the places in your life you'll see this. Like mm -hmm. you can form these connections and then mm -hmm. be like, that's oh, I'm well, learning science, but there's also this other cool practical, way. like, yeah. This, yeah. even though I'm a non-science right. major, this actually relates to my life. Right. right. Well, some level, I, I feel like that is sort of where the instructor comes in, because at least in this design of the game, it's not, this game isn't designed to be everything to everybody. It's a little piece of mm -hmm. one part of a lesson. You know. but but I, I think, oh, I'm sorry. That's to say, I think one interesting follow-up to this could be something like, you have a story where someone brings you a sample and you use the criteria, the process you learned here to figure out if it's really that mineral or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So like you're the CSI tech? Yeah. Yeah. Another, another yeah. Small yeah. activity I was thinking about was is that they now have to, I mean, so they understand there's a certain process for rock uh -huh. um, or mineral that now maybe another follow-up might be is, okay, what are you interested in and how would you help someone determine what it is? So, I, I don't, but maybe someone loves cars, right? right? How do you identify certain types of cars, right? Just on the road, we just played a game, like, fastest person to identify the car driving ahead of you, right? Like, how do you do that? When you look at the grill, you look at the right. shape, you look at this and that, is it a sedan, is it a truck, or whatever, you know what I mean? Or, yeah. or leaves, right? I know Buddy was a huge spot me, right? right? So, are there three loads, are there five? Things like that that other people might not think of, but you can think up of a quick, you know, just a quick checklist or something to say, hey, this is what I'm interested in. But so helping them make that transfer of knowledge, helping them yeah, apply, absolutely. it's that reflection again, and helping them right. make it relevant. Um, I'm a, we haven't heard from um, the remote viewers, so is there anyone? Oh, yeah. 
as a question over either the phone or the chat room. I forgot to mention that earlier. So if you do, just either speak up or type. <laughs> Will we, will we see your stuff like that? Um, I have it on. Oh, you yeah. 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 I mean, I thought that, I mean, I guess I, I'm, I'm from, my, my department is from teacher education, so that's why I'm thinking cool. about a lot from a teacher yeah. teacher's perspective. And um, I was stuck thinking, like, you know, if the classroom, that's what I was asking about, what's the teacher's role, what's the teacher right. doing? I mean, if the teacher is just basically monitoring and then guiding them through certain things, I mean, that wouldn't require a lot of teacher education done for the teacher. I mean, there should be, but still, I mean, it's more about how to navigate the game, what they would be going through. But if you had something like, if you could, like, sort of gamify the classroom, for example, if you had, like, places where students can just use certain hashtags of a game and then keep on t tweeting about it on their Twitter, and the teacher could have a chance to monitor the hashtag, like a tweet chat, right. and go through those things and see certain patterns, what t students think about, or, like, uh, where students are stuck, or where students are, 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 are struggling, teacher can actually see that during the class and try to um, incorporate that in the later part of the class, in the later part of the class where students usually had struggles or yeah. could go over again with extra um, explanations. Yeah. Mean, yeah, I might be stepping on something totally different. But no, <laughs> but, no, but that's a great way yeah, to that's what I, that's data <laughs> and to have, uh, analyze it later. In a flipped classroom, too, because the teacher could set them up to have the same kind of Is that comparable to what it took when you did the different version, but very similar in the in your classroom? Well, I think a normal lab time is two hours here. And it, so it was a two-hour lab. Yeah, I think it. I think it took. Well, yeah, I'm trying to. What did the PA say? People, even the people who they knew were slow all the time, basically could get it done in the two hours. But there were right. numbers. Does this game include any kind of tutorial explaining the test? Yeah, good point. Not really. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, there's just kind of the beginning part that just sets up the storyline. Um, <laughs> directly relevant. Yeah, so it doesn't really explain the point that much. Yeah, here's what we're doing. This is on the side. Did you get any? No one has. No one's entered any text questions. So I've been watching. Um, the the interesting thing is this could probably even be applicable to younger students. Yeah. Um, okay. In this format, and actually leaving out objectives would be more beneficial to younger students because they just don't have the maturity level usually to focus on an objective sure. or understand the purpose or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's a good idea, and it Identifying is. Identifying dinosaurs. Well, <laughs> it it well you, you can try to make it into apps so that yeah. younger kids could just have it hands on. And nowadays, I saw I saw it from our, some article that nowadays um, the iPad exceeded the amount of computers they have in school, schools. So you know you're likely going to see an iPad rather than a laptop now nowadays in a school. Um, yeah. State of yeah. Florida yeah. has yeah. gone yeah. totally to yeah. the e-book. Yeah. Kindle be oh, really? iPads in yeah. the classroom. Oh, They're okay. yeah. transition over the next decade that every textbook we replace to an e-book. Um, oh. They wrote it into law, um, and then you know most schools are going to e-books. Yeah. So you're going to have some type of tablet. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to have a tablet. In there. So, so yeah, have, having it as in an app would be actually a fun idea. Yeah. 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 And you can have like different seasons of it, like so. Got to get out of Flash, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, poor Jack. He's like, oh, I just learned Flash, and now everyone knows. I have a question for this group. I assume most of you are. are is it right? Assuming most um, of you are affiliated with Gaming Commons or. No, you're just people from all over the institution. I mean, I know a lot of you are interested in this topic, or 
Yeah, well, I know you are. <laughs> yeah. Because my question is, you know, so, so if a faculty member like Eliza wants to do something like this, or she's got this, this great, I hate to even call it prototype because it's more advanced than that, but her programmer has moved away and whatever, we're lucky. We have resources within our institute where Eliza um, is to, to help her. But what about, what if you didn't? Is the Gaming Commons a place somebody goes, or do they just put a Help Wanted sign up and um, say? Instructional design. They have a design studio where they teach students to actually develop apps and different items like this, and to actually go ahead and hook up um, database applications to do learning analytics. So find an INSYS professor who Correct. Um, might want students working on a project. And like actually, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hooper, Simon Hooper, yep. he, he's oh, We know him does, well, yeah. He does a science uh, design studio, and um, it's something you could go ahead and they're yeah. learning databases and different things like that. So it's a project where you could give them over yeah. and someone could take over. Yeah, it's cool. It should be kind of cool. It is, because I've always thought, well, I mean, part of this wasn't even supposed to be any product. It was, it was Jeff Rowe yeah. how to do it. And mm -hmm. to me, that, that was a good enough outcome, whatever you produce, almost. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I really, I, I mean. It actually works is great, actually, you know. Because for me, I'm like, well, I, I could program it myself, but that's not fun if you can teach a student to do it. That's yeah, exactly. Right. No, I love that idea. Because, yeah, I mean, we yeah. could, you know, do it in house on Eliza's right. She's she is no slouch when it comes to programming herself. But I love that idea of being able to keep getting students involved. Yeah, and the That's thing me. is, once you get the database and the analytics set up, yeah. you can change the front end any way you want. Right. Yeah. You could even, you could even right. get in visual art students in the art department right. to go ahead and do that who are learning HTML code. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, you can really cross cool. platform through all the disciplines. Well, Ned, when you were talking about the different platforms, I would think that ideally it'd be HTML based or you know something that web based, HTML so that you can use it on yeah, do HTML five, so you could use it on any device. That's true. Right. That would be everything. I you know I'm I, this is not my field, but everything I, instructional design is, but not gaming. But everything I've read says yeah, shoot for that. Don't shoot for like iOS or you know yeah, because yeah. you're limiting yourself yeah. too much. Another resource. You know, interns are always a good resource, but especially for someone who's sort of interested in learning more anyway, is lynda.com because they've got lots of free tutorials. And oh, class. for that person to learn, yeah. Because I, I had an instructor that Linda. had some really great ideas and that eventually pointed them to that. Yeah, that's a great resource for all of us. To follow up on your question, I mean, we, we do do development with faculty members. Um, we do have a kind of a limited bandwidth. As far we as submitted this one and it got rejected. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. Out of that lack of love. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great, yeah. yeah. We thought it was an awesome <laughs> idea. Um, no, it is a fantastic idea. I think we, <laughs> yeah, limited program. resources. No, I totally yeah. understand that. But I think one of the things that we want to be able to do as well is, you know, submit for grants too and help people find places. So if you wanted to turn yeah. more programmers and more resources. I think something, especially in terms of getting grants, is if you can think of a way that it's not just solving this one educational problem, okay. like we talked about. We take this framework and write a story where you're looking for car parts or right. cross, yeah. 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 cross, yeah. cross discipline. <laughs> but that's where the learning analytics need to come in because you need some type of qualitative or quantitative data for yeah. it. But I think that idea of critical thinking in STEM, broader STEM sciences, uh, is that goal? I mean, to me, there's so many you know, NSF and MacArthur, and there's so many folks that are interested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So, uh, there's not, of course, not everything. Mm -hmm. Once everything's linked up, you know, in the next version, and your database, do you imagine uh, sort of giving students feedback when they submit? So you submit, here we, here's what I think my answers are. Does it go in and then they'll get graded based on that, or do they get kicked back and say, nope, this is right, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Or, I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about what I was, exactly how I was going to be graded, because I wasn't going to do it, so. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it could be more in the reflection, and that would be perfectly yeah, acceptable. Yeah, I mean, at some level, I, I'm actually even hoping for for like for a way to log intermediate steps because it would be interesting to be able to to even give you a little feedback while they're going through it. Just be like, you are not very good at picking out all the information that you could, kind of thing, and keep trying, or you know, or something like that. And I feel like that's. I guess I was thinking more of a, of a reflection grade. But I was sort of hoping that at least part of the grade would be on whether they solved it or not. But it's a little bit like, it's a little bit like, um, I'd say it's more like a crossword puzzle than like Sudoku, because like with Sudoku, like if you get like one thing wrong but you don't catch it right away, you might as well just throw it out because there's no way that you possibly go back and like, trace the first number that you got wrong or something else. And in the end, all you have is a grid of numbers anyway. It's not like meaningful words. Whereas with a crossword puzzle, you can always figure out, like, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Like, if I make a mistake in crossword, we're still going back and finding it. And so that's why I throw it out later tomorrow, because I'm like, forget it. <laughs> and I feel like this is, like, since it's a logic puzzle, like, like you, it's, it's pretty hard to, it's pretty hard. You'd have to be wrong in sort of multiple ways that complement each other perfectly to not get it right at the end, or else you've just given up, almost. So some level, yeah, I mean, I think everyone in the pilot ended up with the right answer at the end. But so well, it I mean, all goes back to what are your, you know, yeah, defining yeah. what your learning outcomes are up front, and then right. that's what you grade. Yeah, at some level, I was going to kind of wait and see, too, because I just figured, well, once this thing gets finally built, and there's the ability to track things, then I might realize that the interesting thing to track is a different thing that I find, mm -hmm. which is also the way science works. So, the thing that you so the only thing is when you do do the back-end database, then that means you have to do it on a broad spectrum. Right, I know. Um, yeah. But like they were saying, he was saying Twitter or yeah. using, like, using Angel to do a board discussion. Mm -hmm. If you want to go ahead and do it that way, then you can get the qualitative coding and that yeah. and, and do what you're talking about picking and choosing, but this is the perfect time to do that is in this developmental stage. Because mm -hmm. now you're fine, you've already been doing it. You already pulled pulled out and coded different things. Right. Um, so how to improve it and so on. So yeah. um, oh, we you're on the right track. Yeah. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, at some level, even something simple that you could infer from, like, like a little clock that would say, you know, every every elapsed time of X, we're gonna we're gonna the database is gonna record how much of your little chart you filled in yet, mm -hmm. and and sort of benchmark that against how well everybody does. I mean, you wouldn't really know how well how people are doing or feeling, but you'd have some inferential data points that they didn't have to reflect on directly about how they gotten in some length of time, or or how 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 much their chart was filled in compared to the number of clues around the room that this is. I guess I just keep going back again, the learning outcomes. If your outcome, your general one is that they learn the process, the scientific yeah. process, then it's uh, then you can start thinking, well then does, does that matter? Does time matter? Does you know because right. yeah. that would be kind of a well it's interesting but it doesn't mean you aren't getting it. It right. just means that you're slower or you know yeah. I mean, is there is there an opportunity for some sort of follow up activity? Right. Um, like, what are what are identify some of the techniques used to identify minerals or something like that? Right. Right. See if they're right. kind of absorbing yeah, that. Or even, or even some kind of pre and post that doesn't necessarily involve minerals, so identifying something else like leaves or tree bark. Yeah. Or yeah. And and try what to would you try to see first and yeah. try to see if if this game helps them be more efficient at a task like that later because they've internalized it. One of the things that we, we brought up the Sudoku versus the crossword puzzle, <laughs> one of the things I started thinking about was the, the trouble I have in the games that we've done before. And when do you really want to tell them that they've done something wrong? Yeah. Because they could get to the very end. I know you said that they're locked out of certain rooms, but you want to tell, like, they click the wrong button and it's nope right away. You did it wrong, or do you let them get to the very end and say, like, somewhere there's a mistake and go find it? Um, I, 
I don't know that I have the right answer to that. Or I think, um, I know in some courses I've taught, if you wait too long to help somebody realize that they're going down the wrong path, and that person ends up solidifying this conception, which takes you a lot longer to get rid of later. But if you catch them right away, then you're just holding their hand, and I'm like, everybody calls them, you know, like, <laughs> this is not testing me, so, right, there's a, yeah, there's a balance that I don't know if there's a right answer. That's the thing with this, you can go ahead and track in a database and you can develop in a later end where to put those key elements in to flag someone and stop them from going down the wrong path and going down. Um, like I said, or you can flag a teacher if it's being used in a classroom mm -hmm. to come over and say, hey, how are you doing? Is everything okay? And if they're fine, they're fine, but if not, they're getting a little frustrated, the teacher can step in and help them. Yeah. Um, but it can always be set into Someone says correction or hints. Um. Oh, in, in what Chris was saying, so instead of saying, eh, you're wrong, maybe you give them a hint, like, uh -huh. oh, you might want to rethink that, <laughs> what about blah, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what they mean. I'm not saying you're wrong, but you're wrong. Right? Yeah, really. Um, he said yes. You got yeah, it. Okay, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, there are games where they actually... <laughs> Their way of correcting you, like if it's a thermodynamics game, like your correction, maybe your virtual engine blows up or something, they like let the worst possible <laughs> right <laughs> happen, and <laughs> that's a good way to remember. <laughs> what maybe your character is. frowns or something, yeah. or looks all frustrated. Oh, you know, yeah. like, oh. yeah, that's right. We don't have the character changing Facebook. Which would be pretty fun. Yeah. Well, it was either Jason or maybe that was like all oh, time. We made them look just like ponds in the game. They had like little roundy bottoms. Yeah. Like, oh, Jesus. And then everyone was like, "What's Cluedo?" We were like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> They were fairly far along, yeah. and I panicked yeah, yeah, yeah. because, you know, Eliza wasn't in the room, so I was just in the room with these young, you know, not very experienced, and I was like, um, did you guys think about copyright? Because I don't think, you know. So it was very relieving to... They spent a long time verifying that that was true, yeah. and we were very surprised, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, because the first time I mentioned, I remember they were like, ugh. But then they would be like, oh, yeah, actually, it's cool. We don't have to change a thing. And, and it wouldn't have been hard to have changed their names and yeah. so forth. So, well, you know, it still would have worked. like trying to get non-scandalous people, right? So first they were like, we can't use Ben Roethlisberger. How about try Paul Marlowe? He's never been in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe we should just go for an honesty. Yeah, not do oh, sports, too. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tiger Woods. Oh, oh, no, right. Right. Like, no, 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 no. no. Think of, right? Lance Armstrong. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> I mean, we should just start going for people where like, everyone knows they've been in trouble the whole time and there's no question anymore. Like, so bomb, make them the bad guy, yeah. yeah. The evil. <laughs> the evil. <laughs>
in college who know Clue, and they play Clue. It's just um, it's they do they set up mystery theaters and that's yeah. Part of it. I mean, cool. there are still people who do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's just if you wanted to really make a trend, you could involve a zombie somewhere in there. <laughs> oh, there you know, go. True. I have a zombie chasing you. That <laughs> hurry up! They stole it. They stole it. In a lot of ways, it might be better that they don't remember because then they're not completely. Oh well, this is like Clue, but the graphics aren't as good. <laughs> no, that's is, true. Let's just yeah. enjoy it yeah. for what it is. Yeah, you don't have to look on shoulder. And then next time they play Clue, <laughs> they'll well. Like that's just like a life of Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are at our time, so um, there aren't any other questions. Oh, uh, yeah, Griff Lewis said, uh, sorry, I had to go. Love the game. Oh, yeah. oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is Another one? Yeah. Yep. So far, three things. Yeah, really. I highly recommend the one with the tomatoes. Is there a virtual pizza for the We haven't figured that one out yet. Yeah, we can borrow the Pizza Hut and make your own pizza game. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, the one with tomatoes on it is a white pizza with no red sauce. It's really good. Thank you. We're here on the airway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pledge now. Pledge Absolutely. Open. I'm not actually glad we can. I'm excited to hear what happens when you get a chance to put it in class. I know, it'll be fun. <laughs>